Hi, this is Tony McLaughlin. I'm from uh, Citibank and I'm talking payments with Scott Gallup, who is the CEO of Payneer. Hi, Scott. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Tony. Always a pleasure to see you. Hey, Scott, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and Payoneer? Sure. I mean, I'm the CEO of Payoneer. Been here now, actually closing in on 10 years. Uh, been involved in emerging payments for about 20 years, working with companies like MasterCard, First Data, uh, banks like MetaBank in the U.S., you know, always working on some type of you know, cutting edge financial service uh, product and, and really kind of looking forward about kind of the intersection of technology and financial services and, and kind of looking to the future. Uh, Payoneer, we're a global payment company that really tries to connect the entire world together on a single platform, make it as easy to do business globally as it is locally, democratize access to financial services for the smallest business in the most emerging market, all the way through the biggest digital business in the most developed market, and really try to provide a range of services to help them succeed in our digital world. So that's what we're doing. And Scott, just to kind of make that real for people, like the kind of uh, use cases that you support, I think you support, for example, it's just one of the things that you do, but um, like a, a freelance photographer who is selling through a number of different digital platforms and therefore being paid by a number of digital platforms would, for example, use a pay in your wallet to receive those payments? That, that would be an example use case? Absolutely. So we have uh, millions of professionals and small businesses that come from 200 countries around the world that use Payoneer to get paid, uh, typically, and we help them get paid in a variety of ways. As you said, it could be a freelance photographer. It could be a, a digital outsourcing agency that actually works with lots of different contract workers and helps them actually source jobs around the world. Uh, and on that side, we're really on the receivable side for the most part, helping them actually get and manage payments, different countries, different currencies, different platforms around the world. Yeah. And then we also work with companies like Airbnb or a Shutterstock or other uh, large digital platforms typically in helping them make payments around the world to suppliers that are selling through their platforms or that they need to make payments to. And this was one of the things about your company when I first got introduced to you many years ago um, that I found interesting because many uh, companies in the payment space kind of look at the, the originator, the payer as being the client. Um, whereas you look at both ends as being the clients, is that right? Absolutely. And for us, that really was one of the critical things that we thought about, you know, in a, and when we think about a digital world and we think about how interconnected everything becomes and how technology really facilitates all of this interconnection, we think a lot of the power comes from kind of platforming activity and creating this kind of meta layer where you can really make magic happen if all parties that are participating are on a common infrastructure. Yeah. And it's obviously famously difficult to create that kind of um, ecosystem where you capture both ends. So what's been the secret of your success in capturing both ends of that ecosystem and creating that ecosystem? Yeah. I mean, first luck, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you know, candidly, I think, uh, you know, we, we had certainly some smart people well before I got here, uh, you know, who, uh, who understood how the world was changing. And they saw that there were going to be uh, merchants that were going to try to sell around the world, but they also saw that there were business around the world that were going to try to sell into other markets in an accelerated way through platforms. And so they started to sell these platforms an opportunity to basically plug in with a single API and pay the whole world. And what they did, which was really smart, is they put the Payoneer brand on what they were doing. So by putting the Payoneer brand on it, the seller knew they were working with Payoneer. And so that first company that used us to make payments, those recipients then said, hey, Payoneer is helping me get paid. Hey, Payoneer, can you help me get paid from this other company? And they actually then went to those other companies and said, hey, Payoneer can help me get paid. Can you use Payoneer? Yeah. To pay yeah. me. So our business has really been this evolution of a series of interconnecting network effects mm. where basically the, the buyers bring sellers, the sellers bring buyers. And again, I think it was a little bit smart and probably even a little more lucky 
that someone decided to put a brand in there that actually helped people know how to actually identify this kind of connecting point in the middle. And so your customers, essentially, your, you, the beneficiaries of these payments essentially became your sales force in a way. They really did. And so we yeah. actually, we've harnessed that to this day. The number one source of new customers for us are our existing customers. So we have yeah. a referral platform, very much kind of a digital first approach to the way we engage customers and actually drive more activity. Uh, and so it really has been the, the series of network effects. Now, now, Scott, you're one of the more high concept uh, thinkers in the payment space, and I'm going to- uh, I think that about you, to- so all right, <laughs> so yeah. I want to play back to you something that you said to me, I mean, many years ago, eight years or so uh, ago, you said to me when I was trying to, um, you know, plug your uh, brains for information about the payment space, um, you said something to me very cryptic that took me years to decode, uh, which is you said that the world is developing an application layer. And I believe this might even predate the, the famous Mark Andreessen quote where he said that, that software is eating the world. I apologize if I get the, the chronology wrong, but you no, may even have predated yeah. that quote. But were you, were you really talking about the, the platformization of the global economy? What, what, we, what were you talking about in your own words? Yeah, I mean, I think a few different things that kind of led to, to that. I mean, and for one, you know, I think I was fortunate before I was in financial services, I was in the internet space. So I actually worked in an internet software company very early mm. days of internet in the, in the early 90s. Uh, I was an investment banker. I took eBay public. And so, you know, I was, I was there kind of at the beginning looking at what it means to create a platform that actually is the face to the consumer and how behind that platform can be all kinds of either legacy information or legacy content, but that if you control that, that application layer, that front end that the customer engages with, that you can actually, again, kind of make magic happen and you can hide what's behind it. So going back to my early days, Yahoo was an example that I, I talked about. Yahoo, and which I don't even know if they exist anymore as a brand, which is amazing, you know, they created a directory, right? So they, they created this way for, for customers to get access to content in an organized way. And they didn't create any of the content at the beginning. But by owning that customer interface, by owning that platform, what they were able to see is where those customers were going, what they were interested in doing, and they could aggregate the best of third-party content. And then they vertically integrated and actually would, would create their own content on finance and on sports and on other on news and other areas. So fast forward a little bit into financial services, you know, and I think this was probably more on my mind when we were talking was, you know, there's all this legacy infrastructure, right, all over the world. And there's all these challenges all over the world of of interoperability. But all of a sudden, with APIs uh, and, and businesses are increasingly global, interconnected, technology is frictionless, but we have all this infrastructure around the world that's very heavy and very cumbersome. And what's happening is you can create this layer across the top that is the integrating, aggregating, simplifying layer. You know, mm. let's create the customer experience as something that is magical and what they would expect from any other digital experience that they're having and abstract it from the complexity of all this infrastructure around the world. And so, and if you can do that and create this, this application layer through which everybody interacts, and abstract it from all the, the mess and complexities that sit behind it, there's a tremendous amount of power in creating a great customer experience independent of all the, the challenges that you have to deal with in the legacy infrastructure. And that's really been what we've tried to do, natively global, interconnected, abstracted from the complexity, riding on top, I mean, we're fully dependent on all of the banking infrastructure around the world and regulation and compliance but we really try to approach it in this natively digital way, democratize access by removing a lot of the complexity and friction that exists. Yeah, that's uh, super interesting because if I then think about, um, you know, many FinTech models in a, in a way you could say that many FinTechs are a kind of 
modern layer over a, a legacy banking infrastructure in a sense, right? So I, I banking infrastructures right. are, uh, they run on batch processes. They have, we have end of days, we have cutoff times. Um, the banking industry is kind of like a domestic industry because that's where the, the licenses are granted. So you're saying that really fintechs that can sit on top of the banking infrastructure can present a better layer to the end customer. Absolutely. And look, you know, being very candid, you guys are actually one of the pioneers, right? I mean, your, your business of serving large corporates that were multinationals, this is something that you all figured out to at least to some extent a long time ago and actually, you know, have built an amazing global platform that really does try to simplify the ability for a, a large corporate with lots of diversity, lots of geographies and lots of activities to really simplify it on a single platform. I mean, I you've just given me a very softball target there to plug uh, Citibank's global network. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to swing for it. <laughs> I'm going I'm to leave that there just, uh, just hanging. Um, but I also wanted to say to you another very memorable thing you said to me in terms of um, your thoughts about how to, uh, you know, be successful in this in, in any environment. Um, I once asked you why you were not one of the prominent speakers at, uh, at these industry conferences. And of course, these days, there, there, well, there have been many payments industry conferences, the hot topic. And your response, again, this was several years ago, you said, um, strategy is underrated and why should I stand up in front of 10,000 people and tell them my strategy? So is that, is that still your belief is that strategy is actually not just a kind of commodity, it's really important? I mean, I'm a huge believer in that. I mean, I really think that uh, strategy matters. There, only, there aren't that many things that actually at the end of the day can create sustainable competitive advantage. And most of them to me come back to people uh, and I think culture and uh, actually really having uh, investments in and respect for the, the power and difference that good strategy versus mediocre strategy versus bad strategy and what that can do uh, I think is absolutely critical. I mean, I think it doesn't mean you can't build a good business by being a fast follower or things like that, but absolutely. I think there's not a lot of really good innovation that happens. Uh, yeah. And I really think that if you have a view of where the world is going, and if you have a view of what the needs of customers will be when the world gets to where it's going, and you can think about, you know, on kind of all of the different levels, right? I mean, there's so many dimensions that you have to sort through in a business like this uh, of how to actually navigate from here to there. Uh, yeah, we do lots of things that are not obvious. I mean, for years, I would have people come up to me and say, you know, how are you building such a big business doing mass payouts? Like, great. That's exactly my goal is for you to think that all we're doing is mass payouts and we do mass payouts and we're proud of doing mass payouts, but that is far from the entire picture of what we're doing. Yeah. I don't need everybody to know all the things we're working on today that are going to hit the market and have an impact in 2021 and 2022. Yeah. You're not, give, you're not going to give the game away here either. So I'm not going to ask too many probing questions, but I, I did want to, um, you know, my final topic here is about, uh, the role of platforms and in, in particular there's one thing that I'm interested in which is um, how financial services will be embedded into platforms and there it seems to me there are different models I mean one very striking model is in China platforms have their own financial services arms um, so think of you know Alibaba and Alipay these two things are, are integrated together and Alipay is a tremendous uh, you know, market value. But if I look at the, I feel like the West Coast tech players without naming any particular names, it still seems to me that they seem to think about finance, financial services as being, I feel like an enabler of their core business without being a core business themselves. So do you see that uh, bifurcation continuing or do you see the West Coast tech players actually um, coming into financial services with their own 
self-manufactured products? I mean, for sure, we are seeing uh, a meaningful intersection of commerce and financial services, you know, in, in ways that people have talked about, you know, for a very long time. And, and I think we are seeing an acceleration of that. Um, I don't think we know yet what the business models are going to look like, meaning how much of it will be only in support of commerce or only to facilitate uh, other kinds of, you know, behavior and investments that they're making in their business and how much will be to really be standalone business models. But you are absolutely seeing meaningful investments and absolutely seeing uh, meaningful activities. But one of the big platforms, you know, an executive there told me once, it's like, you know, we are, our advertising business is so powerful and so efficient you know, financial services really looks pedestrian by comparison. I mean, the yeah. margins are terrible. The, the number of people you need to, to generate value. I mean, it's just really not the kind of business that we run. We really try not to hire very many people to, to, to grow. And so, you know, so there are big differences, uh, but we're seeing all of them. And if you remember, obviously, you know, PayPal really exists because of eBay. I mean, you know, PayPal was independent at the beginning, but PayPal solved for eBay and eBay solved for PayPal. The same thing that Alipay was for, for Alibaba, which was there was a lot of friction. And when there are problems and friction in commerce, you know, those needs will make the businesses figure out how to address those themselves. And in that case, eBay bought PayPal and you know, obviously, uh, Alibaba used Alipay to make sure that people could buy online without as much friction as existed before. Uh, yeah, so, but, you know, what's interesting about that example is that if you look at the relative market values of, of those companies, eBay and PayPal now, PayPal's market cap is, I think, 3x that of, uh, of eBay. So the actual commerce platform is less valuable than the, if you like, the fintech platform that was, you know, connected to it for so many years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in that case, PayPal was early enough to the digitalization wave that they actually really were able to create. I mean, I said they exist because of eBay. They did a fantastic job of actually creating real value um, and give them a, a ton of credit. But Alipay is, is worth a fraction of Alibaba, right? Of so so there are, yeah. it's not the same everywhere. And, and I think if you True. have a scale platform that really is you know, driving significant value, uh, then I think by comparison, there's more value to extract in that business model than in a financial services business model, I think. So Scott, I could, I could um, you know, plug you for information about the platform economy and FinTech for a long time. Um, but I want to ask you actually, um, just to finish up, what's your um, thought process about the period that we're going through at the moment? I mean, how do you kind of, um, mentalize it what's your uh you know takeaway from what we're going through and um i'd also like to know that if things get back to whatever normal is going to be um what from the current experience would you like to maintain in your current way of life what would you like to keep going you know i, don't, I doubt if these resolutions will ever be uh, kept but i think mine would you I like might, to keep yes. going yeah uh great questions and uh yeah, and obviously I look forward to getting together in person again sometime soon and having a much longer conversation than this as we, uh, as we often do. Um, I mean, look, I mean, we've been focused, you know, there are different types of fintechs that focus on different things. And, you know, obviously technology is a part of all of it, but we have been focused not just on using technology to digitalize financial services, we've been focused on using technology to enable digital business to happen. So we've been focused on digitalization of commerce and what are the services that need to be delivered, which obviously in that context are going to be digital to mm. actually make that happen. And when we look at what's happening, we think of really an acceleration of trends that have been ongoing for quite some time. Uh, everything from, you know, the digitalization of, of consumer purchasing. Uh, in fact, now, I mean, even your corner store, is actually now needs to interface with consumers in a more digital way than ever before, sure. right? My, my mother, 
who didn't want to shop online at all, you know, now only shops online. And I don't think she's going into a retail store anytime in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, she, you know, where so many people, of my generation and, and younger, you know, they start their online shopping at Amazon. You know, my mom started at Walmart, right? So for her, it was a brand that she was more comfortable with that was her bridge into the digital world. Um, we, we're a play on the digitalization of, of work and how work can be remote. We're obviously all seeing how there's an acceleration of remote work and we expect that that will really continue to accelerate uh, in the future. Even alternative travel, which is something that we've played a, a, a role in, we think actually there will be an, a faster acceleration uh, as people start traveling of more private spaces you know, where people are yep. more to themselves with their families as opposed to big spaces crowded with people that they don't know. And so, so we think there's a lot of these trends uh, that will continue to accelerate. And so, uh, so overall, long term, we're super bullish. Short term, there's a lot of things to think about, like what happens as countries come off lockdown and governments and really encourage people to buy locally and what happens mm. to digital commerce and you know, I think there will be some waves here of, of kind of different forces at work, positively and negatively on some of these different markets. But, but overall, the trend is up and to the right for everything digital. We think this has accelerated that by years. And so we're actually pretty bullish. Um, yeah. And personally, I'm actually pretty yeah. bullish about this. You know, I think you know, and I think you do a fair amount of this yourself. I travel a ton. We've got a global business, you know, really spanning the four corners of the world. And so I travel a lot. Um, you only fly coach, right? That's another famous thing about PNU. You only I, fly coach. I do only fly coach. So I, if there's an upgrade available and I qualify for it, we will, uh, we will do that. But yeah, <laughs> we fly coach. Um, and uh, yeah, if I think I will travel less, uh, you know, I could see going less often to certain places than I do now. I will talk to them more. So my yeah. bre I do breakfast with Asia much more now than I did before. It's easy for me. I can pop on at 10 o'clock at night and can be there morning time and you know, see everybody and interact. And I can be in 10 countries at once and we can talk yeah. much more often. And so that's actually uh, really nice. And personally, as a result, I've had more family weeknight dinners that I've cooked <laughs> with my kids in the last two months than I have, I think literally in the last 10 years. And I don't think I'll be able to do it as much in the future as I have now, but I know for sure I will make more of a point of being home for dinner. So Yeah, that's terrific. Well, I'm not sure if you're a good cook, so I can't see if your kids enjoy the cooking, yes or no, but it's a thought. We do okay, okay together, so yeah. <laughs> but Scott, thanks very much uh, for a great conversation. Great talking to you, and I, I very much look forward to uh, picking back up with you face to face. Yeah, me too. Thanks a lot. Always a pleasure, Tony. Yeah.